symmetries in machine learning models uh, by Soledad Vidar, who is uh, Villar, sorry, from John Hopkins University and partly a visiting scientist at Apple these days, from what I understood. Soledad, you are welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much to the organizers uh, for inviting me. So uh, the first time that I was here was about like 10 years ago when I was a master's student in Uruguay, in Montevideo, where uh, the other organizer who I haven't met yet uh, is, uh, is from. And I think it's, a very, it's very nice that, that this institution gives opportunities to people from like uh, South America to come here, do research and learn. So I was a student when I came and now 10 years later I come and I give a talk here. So it's like a very emotional, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's like a very nice, uh, nice uh, opportunity. So thank you to the organizers for, for this and for the, to the institute, yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about approximate symmetries in machine learning models. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two projects, mainly about one project with my PhD student, Teresa Huang, who uh, is graduating next year and she's uh, a great uh, um, researcher and also a great person, so it's very, uh, I'm very happy to work with her. So the, um, and I, if you see, I, it seems like I have uh, 47 slides, but actually I only have like 15, just disclaimers so that you don't get anxious. And then the, the rest of the slides are just to clarify questions or if you, if you want me to discuss other topics, I'll be happy to go over them. But just like the main part of the talk is um, just a shorter thing. So the motivation for this talk is uh, to talk about inductive bias in deep learning. Uh, so if you, um, if, if you are not familiar with some of these uh, questions or like if you want, if you have questions, uh, please ask, uh, I'll be happy to make it this interactive. So it's just to make sure that uh, I'm talking to uh, the audience in the right way. So uh, if, you have, if you haven't seen it uh, yet, there is a very um, well-known paper by Belkin and collaborator in, 2019 that explained this like double descent phenomenon that occurs in like very overparameterized machine learning models, uh, which is the models that people use these days for uh, chat GPT and like all these uh, deep learning uh, models. So these models what have the property that are very overparameterized. So typically you have way more parameters than data points in these models uh, that, than training data points. And so, uh, so then, since you have this situation, you have many, many possible, uh, optim like, oh, possible models in your class of functions that can fit your data perfectly. Uh, and some of them generalize well, and some of them don't. Uh, so you want to understand which ones are the ones that are going to generalize well, and how can you design the class of functions so when you train it, so basically when you do gradient descent, um, just local optimization, you converge to a uh, local optima, hopefully, that has good generalization properties so that it works well in unseen data. So uh, the double descent uh, phenomenon uh, like has a plot in this, in this form where basically what they do is they say, well, in the classical statistical regime, uh, you have like this you known bi bias variance trade-off where uh, if your model is not very expressive, you may not have a lot of uh, variance, but, um, but uh, the bias is huge because maybe you cannot express uh, the, the data. Um, and then when you have too many parameters, you can overfit to your training data, but the, but the model uh, can fit your training data perfectly, but it doesn't generalize, so it overfits. So here in this plot, you have like, this is like the training error, which is always decreasing with the capacity of the model, hopefully. And then you have the test error, which uh, goes uh, uh, down and up. And then there's like a sweet spot, which is the bias, the best bias variance trade-off point, and that's the best model that you can use. And so what they say is that in these deep learning models, in these overparameterized models, uh, what happens is that you, you still observe this bias variance trade-off uh, where you have a point where like your model is very overparameterized, you overfit. But then if you add more and more parameters, there's some form of implicit regularization that is happening, and then the, the test error decreases monotonically, and sometimes you can have 
that in the overparameterized regime, you get a test error that is smaller than the best thing that you can have in the other parameterized regime. That's, uh, that's the idea that they say. So, um, and then the, there's like a very simple explanation for, uh, for linear models. Why does the peak, this peak occur and why you can see that this, uh, that this decreases. There's a, a, some, a couple papers by Hasty and collaborators that explain this for linear models. And there's a paper by Bartlett and collaborators that is called benign overfitting that explains uh, why you can have a smaller error in the overparameterized regime. And I have some slides about it. If you want to discuss it later, I'd be happy to do that. But at this point, I'm just going to say that this is the setting. And so the question is like, how can you design models that have the right inductive bias? So when you, uh, when you are over in the overparameterized regime, you still uh, have a good, uh, a good performance. And so it's not always that it happens that you go up and down. Uh, you can have a bad design models where like the, the test error is, is, uh, is, is large even in the overparameterized regime. So the question is like, how can you design these models that have these nice properties? And so uh, the, the idea uh, is that uh, some people are um, focusing in is the, the use of symmetries in the design of machine learning models. And if you see like what are the machine learning architectures that are successful for, for many problems these days, they all have the property that exploit some uh, exact symmetries or approximate symmetries. So for, for instance, convolutional neural networks are the architecture that change how deep learning was perceived. And one of the properties that it had was that it's approximately equivalent with respect to translations. And um, graph neural networks are uh, equivalent with respect to the action of permutations. And transformers can also express many symmetries. And so there is like something in the design of the class of functions that is exploiting the symmetries. And, uh, and, and, and this workshop is about the structured data and structured models. So in, imposing symmetries in machine learning models is one of the themes. And so uh, another motivation to think about symmetries is the, the, the fact that symmetries are everywhere uh, in the physical sciences. So not only in the actual world, like you have symmetries that come from uh, conservation of, of energy or conservation of momentums uh, that are given by the physical law. These are called the active symmetries, are, are connected with, um, the symmetries are, cons are, are connected with conserved quantities in, in, um, in certain physical systems. Uh, but, but also you have symmetries that, are not, that don't have to do with uh, the actual world, but the way you represent the world. So if I have a physical system, I can express it in a coordinate system, and then the choice of coordinates is arbitrary. So if I do a different choice of coordinates, then there is like a reparameterization of the world that I can do, and then the predictions of my models should be uh, predictable with respect to that parameterization, reparameterization. So that you can write in terms of a, an equivalent with respect to a group action, an equivalence with respect to a group action. So the fact that there's not a unique way to represent the world, there's always arbitrary choices. And if you want to write machine learning models uh, that are going to generalize, and maybe you want them to generalize to different coordinate systems, you want, to want, them, want them to generalize to different forms of representing your data, then you, the ideal way to do it is by writing them in a coordinate-free way. And that's, uh, that's one of the ideas. So if you can implement coordinate uh, freedom or units equivalence or gauge invariances in machine learning models, you may be able to generalize better. And so that's a claim. So how do we mathematically write these symmetries in machine learning models? Uh, using group actions. So the idea is that if you have a group G that acts on a data set, then you may you may have that um, you want to find a function that is invariant with respect to that group action, meaning that if I apply my group uh, element, uh, I act on the input, then the output doesn't change. So for example, here I have an image classification problem. If I rotate the image, the classification value doesn't change. So that's an invariance. Or an equivariance, uh, if I have the group acting on the output as well, then um, I say that a function is equivalent if every time that I do a transformation to the input, 
then the output transforms by the same group action, or like by, the, by an action of the same group element. It doesn't need to be the same group action. Uh, it could be that the group acts differently in the input and the output, but you can have that the action by this group element in the input corresponds to an action by the same group element in the output. And I'll give you an example where the group action is not the same. So in this, in this example here, I have like a dynamical system and the goal is to predict the state of this dynamical system uh, after a certain amount of time. And so if I rotate my dynamical system, then the output rotates in the same way. And so what does equivariant machine learning do? Uh, they uh, basically, they parameterize the class of functions, the hypothesis class of functions, so where you're going to do the learning, so that for every choice of parameters, the corresponding function satisfies the symmetries. So it's kind of like you're doing the parameterization of the learning in a space where every function satisfies the, limit, the, the symmetries. So uh, one question is how do you do that? And I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but the idea is that you can use representation theory to, to parameterize this class of functions. You can use invariant theory to parameterize this class of functions, so you can do some kind of like averaging over the group elements if your group is small, for instance. That's like the equivariant convolutions, for instance, do that. Uh, but if you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer later. How do you do that? And in practice, most, most, actually in practice, most machine learning models do not implement, like do not parameterize the class of functions that satisfy these symmetries, but they do something called data augmentation, which is like uh, applying the group transformation to some of the inputs and then uh, use that as a way to promote the existence of the symmetries, and there's a lot of math that you can study in this, in that space. So as an example, uh, I'm gonna talk about graph learning. So the idea is that if I have a graph here, and I, uh, I, I have this graph, and I can express, uh, express it as an adjacency matrix, so I have this adjacency matrix that corresponds to this graph, uh, but also I have this adjacency matrix that corresponds to the same graph, because if I do a permutation on the rows and the columns, if I do a, the ordering of, uh, of the nodes in the adjacency matrix is not a property of the graph, so there's kind of like many ways to write this graph as a matrix, so that's a passive symmetry, it's a, another parameterization of the same graph. And so if I'm going to learn a function of the graph, then the function should be invariant with respect to this group action, which is the permutation action, uh, action by conjugation in the input matrix. Uh, so for instance, the shortest path, the length of the shortest path would, would have that property that is invariant with respect to the permutations. Um, if you want to learn an embedding, the typical graph neural network, so like the graph learning problem, uh, for learns an embedding. So learns uh, um, for every node a vector in RD, that is how you embed this node, and then that's what they, they, they do. They learn these representations for the nodes, and then whatever downstream task that they have to perform, they perform it on these learned representations of the nodes. So that representation uh, needs to be equivariant with respect to this permutation. So if I permute the, like the green and the, and, the, and the yellow, then the corresponding embedding will have this permuted as well. So in this case, we can see that this function is equivariant with respect with the action of permutations. In the input, the action is by conjugation. In the output, the action is by multiplication. Uh, so the question is, how can we efficiently parameterize the space of invariant and equivariant functions with respect to permutations? And, um, and so the, the way, I mean, there are many ways to do this, but the most, like the, the, the way that practitioners use the most uh, is using message passing neural networks because they are easy to implement and they're very scalable and they implement the symmetries in a very trivial way. So the idea is you have your graph, here is your graph, and then uh, every, uh, there's a message function uh, that is a global function, and there's a function that takes the state of a node and outputs a message, which is a, 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 I don't know, a vector. And then uh, every node has, a, there's also an aggregate, like an aggregation function, which is like every, that every node uses, and they 
aggregate all the messages that they receive from the enables using, using that, that function that is invariant with respect to permutation. So there is a message function, and then it's an aggregation function, and that is the same function for everyone, so it's a permutation invariant just by definition. So that's the way it's implemented. And, uh, and that, fun that architecture is, uh, is uh, equivalent with respect to permutations by definition. Um, but it has the issue that has like um, limitations on their expressive power. Like uh, if, you have, um, um, if you have a graph and, and uh, the, like if, if you want to learn an invariant function with respect to this uh, action by permutations, then uh, you should be able to be able to like if you want to express all all functions that have this property, then what you want to do is you want to be able to solve the graph isomorphism problem because like the orbits of the uh, group action by this by of a graph by this uh, group action is the isomorphism class of the graph, and and so the graph isomorphism problem is a hard problem. Uh, so. Um, we don't expect to be able to define uh, a, a small architecture that can separate uh, every, every pair of non-isomorphic graphs. So what happens with this architecture is that it has some expressivity issues, and there are some graphs that are not isomorphic, but uh, for every choice of parameters that you put in your machine learning model, the output is the same. So for example, that like one very bad example that, 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 that happens here is that if you have this, this graph, uh, this is two triangles and this other graph is an hexagon, both graphs are uh, two regular graphs with uh, like a, a regular graph with degree two at each node and six nodes in total. And those two graphs are not easily, they, they cannot be separated by this architecture. But of course, you can do other things that like simplify, like that give more expressivity to this class of functions and remove that issue. But basically, you have, you have the, you still have some issues with like what kind of functions you can express. And there is uh, a lot of literature related with something called the weiser liman test, which is a test for graph isomorphism that allows you to characterize what kind of functions can be expressed with these graph neural network architectures and what kind of functions cannot be expressed. And there's a lot of, lot of literature in this space and I'll be happy to discuss it. But basically, this is what they do. They do message passing and then they have uh, functions that are equivalent with respect to this group action, but they cannot express all the functions that are equivalent with respect to this group action. So this is just a subset of the functions. And so uh, what I wanted to talk about is how can we change this, um, this, uh, this structure, like these message passing networks, so that um, we may get better expressivity and better performance in the case where you know that you're learning a function of a fixed graph um, that say you have like a time sequence of, um, of graphs and the, the, of like of graph signals, the graph is fixed and then the signals change over time. And so if you, if you, want, if you have that setting, then you may not want to use a message passing neural network because the symmetries that it imposes are very strong and maybe the symmetries are not that uh, useful for your case. So maybe, maybe it's not necessary to impose all the symmetries and maybe you can get a better bias variance trade-off by uh, relaxing the, the symmetries or breaking the symmetries. So in this case, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah so the, uh, there's two examples that I can discuss. So one is like this like human post estimation problem so you have a graph that represents the joints of, uh, of a skeleton, and then uh, this is like a computer vision application. And so from the 2D uh, positions of the of projected positions of the nodes, you want to predict the, the, the 3D coordinates of the nodes. So that's one. And, and they typically use graph neural networks for that task, uh, this computer vision task. And the other example 
that I had is this uh, traffic flow prediction. So you have a, a, like a road network and you, and you have some um, sensors that can quant like, compute, like calculate how many, uh, what's the, the flow of the traffic and these sensors and you want to predict uh, the, where's, where there's gonna be like a, um, like a traffic jam. So the, fix, the network is fixed, but there's some connectivity in the network that makes sense to study. And then the, uh, the, there's, a time, the, there's a signal that changes with time. Okay. So, um, so in this setting, uh, we have the, the, the idea is that when you, when you have your graph, your graph is like given by your, by your adjacency matrix and your signals, which are supported in the nodes, there are functions on, on the nodes of the graph. And so the, the typical permutation action permutes the signals and permutes the adjacency matrix by the group of permutations. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to fix the, the adjacency matrix and only permute the signal. That's the group action that we're going to do. So this, you can think of this as a passive symmetry and you can think of this as an active symmetry. And when the, uh, when the group that you're using is the automorphism group of the graph, then these two things match, right? Because it fixes the graph. And, and so um, by choosing different subgroups of the permutation group, you can extract something that looks like, uh, like, a, like a double descent curve, and I'm gonna show you that later. So the intuition, going back to the passive active symmetries, the intuition in convolutional neural networks is that uh, you have your sing like you have a gr like you can think of a convolution in your network as a graph in your network, or like as where like your signal is an image uh, that is a, a signal supported in a graph, which is a grid, and then you like the same the kind of like this you can think of a graph in your network as a, ge as a generalization of deep classical convolution in your networks, where you change the topology of the underlying graph. So in the graph neural networks, in the, in the convolution neural networks, you fix your domain and you shift your signal. Uh, and so in the graph neural network symmetry, you shift the, the signal, you permute the, symmetry, the signal and the graph simultaneously. So here we want to kind of like go back to the original convolution symmetry and decouple the permutation of the signal with the permutation of the graph, the underlying graph. So that's the idea. And, and we get something that when, when we relax the symmetries that we can have in these graph neural networks, we can obtain something like the double descent curve that I showed you earlier in the talk. So the idea is uh, when you impose uh, more symmetries, then the class of functions that you can express is smaller. And when you relax the amount of symmetries that you are expressing, then the class of functions that you can get is larger uh, just because of the correspondence between, uh, yeah, the, goes the other direction. And so you can see that you, you can have a, a bias variance trade-off, which is, if you think of like your uh, class of functions indexed by complexity or by graph, the, you, the generalization error will have a, like a, like a, the same kind of shape that you observe with the double descent. And that can be explained by computing uh, the bias variance trade-off uh, with the, the symmetries, the symmetry constraint, where like you replace the like complexity in the x-axis that you had before with the amount of symmetries that you impose. And the way you can write it in a simple setting is that if you have G is a subgroup of the permutation group and your data is sampled by a permutation invariant distribution, um, then uh, you can define the, like given, given data generated by uh, some uh, F star of X plus noise, so there's some F star that you don't know what it is, but it's what generated your data. Given a function f that is your estimator, uh, 
you can decompose it in two parts. You can do the projection of f onto the space of invariant functions and the proje projection of f onto the orthogonal complement of the space of invariant functions. And so the, the risk gap would be the difference in the risk that you have with f minus the difference in the risk that you have with the projection of f onto the space of invariant functions. And that this difference uh, can be, uh, can be, you can write it down as two terms, which one is like the, like the norm of f, uh, f uh, the projection of f onto the orthogonal complement, so whatever you couldn't express of f because you were projecting onto the space of invariant functions, and then another term that you can, that is the inner product that you can, uh, that in some cases you can show that this is actually zero. Uh, so in the case, for instance, in the case of the, uh, in the case of the bias variance trade-off, like if you look at the linear regression uh, case, uh, the, if, you're if you're doing linear regression, then the, the bias, if, if your data, if you have uh, more data points than, than dimensions, then the bias is zero. And this term is kind of like, the, it comes from the bias on the bias variance trade-off. And this is kind of like the, the, um, the variance. And so, um, so using this, we can, I'm, I'm not gonna show you, maybe I can show you that later if you, if you, if you ask, but uh, you can write like a explicit bias variance trade-off for the linear regression using the typical computations that you have for linear regression with approximate symmetries. And you can construct examples where uh, you can uh, change the amount of symmetries, like you can impose more symmetries than your problem has, for instance, and then uh, increase the bias, uh, but reduce the variance significantly. So the same tricks that you can do in the classical statistical settings where like you have an estimator and you can make the risk smaller by increasing the bias a little bit and decreasing the, bi the variance a lot. The same thing you can do here in this, in this setting where like you change the amount of symmetries that you impose in your graph neural networks models. And so, how do you impose this, how do you change these symmetries that you impose? So this, the, the simplest way to do it is if you have a graph neural network, this is done via message passing. So the message function is the same for everyone. But what you can do is you can cluster your nodes and then say the nodes that are the same, like they're in the same clusters, they use the same message functions. And the nodes that are in different clusters can use different message functions. That's one way of breaking the symmetries. And that's something that, uh, that you can do. Um, and then, or other ways, like if you know exactly what symmetries you want to impose, you can use representation theory to parameterize the space of functions with respect to that specific symmetry. Uh, and I, I can explain that later if you want. Okay, so any, uh, and, and I have some examples where like we do this for like this uh, human pose estimation and the traffic flow prediction that I described just earlier. And we look at the implementation of different symmetries and then we see which, which uh, symmetry that you can impose has better performance. And it's typically something in the middle between like the full permutation symmetry and no symmetries at all. And that's. So for instance, here in this tra traffic flow prediction, we can do uh, different clusterings of the nodes and then do different message functions for each of the clusters. And, depend, and, and you can have that, uh, the graph neural network, the classical graph neural network that uses the same message function for every node uh, has smaller performance than, lower performance than the one that, that breaks the, the symmetry in that way. Okay, so um, if you, uh, any questions about this, comments, yes. Yes, uh, 
No, what is SN invariant is the, is the data. So say, for instance, you generate the data from like a Gaussian, and so it's SN invariant, yeah. The target doesn't need to be SN invariant. Or you can think that your target is like G invariant for some G, and then look at uh, different Gs that you can project to, and then if you have a mismatch on like what is the actual G that the function satisfies, versus the G that you impose in your model, then you can compute what is the variance bias by just like having a wrong group uh, in the estimator. Yeah. That, that's a great question. So we only do it on the, on the, graph structure, but it makes sense to, to do a clustering based on the graph and the signals, or even if, if you have some labels, you could even use the labels to, to do the clustering. But here we only do the, the clustering based on the, on the graph, on the graph structure. Like, so for instance here, the, like, oops. So here the, the the graph, the, the, these are the same kind of highways, and the clusters are coming from, like, if, you, if your thing comes from the same highway, then they're in the same cluster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because the the yeah, there's no yeah. Okay. So um so that was the first part of my talk and if you if you were asleep, maybe uh this is a good time to wake up because it's, I'm going to talk about something uh completely different, but it also has a flavor of using approximate symmetries in machine learning models. And uh, this is going to be about uh, contrastive learning, or self-supervised learning. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, this is uh, something that is very uh, widely used right now because they use these like self-supervised models to learn embeddings that they're used for, um, like language models are and uh, language vision models, etc. So basically, the idea is. How can you use your data in a self-supervised way or unsupervised way to learn representations of your data that have meanings? So the, the classical contrastive learning setting is like this picture, which is the, the following. So how do, you, how do you learn these embeddings? So you have images. Here you, have, uh, you want to learn an embedding from images to this space that is you use for representing your images. So here I'm gonna say the sphere. So you're learning uh, embeddings from your images to the sphere. And what you do is you take your image, this image of a cat, and then you do an augmentation of this cat that is like a transformation that could be like a color shifting or like cropping or rotation or some, uh, some transformation that, that is a transformation that doesn't change the fact that it's a cat and then you learn a function so that uh, all these augmented versions of this image uh, are mapped to the same point, and you you have that those are like kind of like your positive pairs, and then you have negative pairs. So, for instance, uh, cats and dogs they come from different classes, so you want to uh, minimize the the distance between the augmented versions of the of the images, and then kind of maximize well, with respect to other negative pairs. So that's the, the classical, like, simpler objective. So this is what I'm saying here. You have a representation from your data, you learn an embedding, and then the loss function that they use, this, like, info and CE, what basically it says is that if you have positive pairs, you want them to be close, and if you have negative pairs, you want them to be apart. That's what it says. So then what we want to do is we want to find a way to do uh, self-supervised learning so that instead of making the, the augmented versions of the data 
to go to the same point, we want them to be equivalent with respect to some group transformation. So basically the idea is that maybe we, can, we want that the augmentations in the, in the input space correspond to rotations in the embedding space, if, if, if you're embedding in the sphere. So you want to kind of like decode these augmentations as like linear transformations in an embedding space. How do you do that? And, and also if you see how the loss function for the classical um, in, uh, contrastive learning is written, it's like given in terms of pairs of points. So we want to do the same. We want to give them in, ter in, in terms of pairs of points. Um, and so in order to do that, we're going to use classical results from invariant theory. So the idea is that if we have, um, um, if, we if we have a function that takes, like so in this example here, we have a function that takes n vectors in Rd and outputs uh, a vector in Rd. So for instance, you can think that it outputs the position of one of the particles or the position of the center of mass. So that if I, uh, if I rotate all my vectors or like if I apply an orthogonal transformation to all my input vectors, then the output rotates in the same way. So um, we can show uh, using classical result from invariant theory that a function is OD equivalent if and only if you can write it as a linear combination of your input vectors using uh, invariant coefficient functions. So it's a linear combination of the input vectors and then the linear combination has some coefficient functions and these functions are invariant. And uh, the invariant functions, the, the first fundamental theorem of OD says that the invariant functions of all the invariant functions are functions of the inner products of your input vectors. You can, you can think that if I have uh, a rotation, I rotate every point, uh, I rotate all my points, the, the inner products don't change, and then the other direction is the first fundamental theorem that you can, you can reconstruct uh, the vectors up to all the uh, using the, or the inner product, from the inner products. Uh, and so, uh, the, from here to here, like the, from the first fundamental theorem to parameterize all the equivalent functions, the idea is that the equivalent functions can be constructed from gradients of invariant functions. Uh, so gradients of functions of inner products, so that's why they look like this. And, and so how do we use this for, uh, for um, equivalent contrastive learning? So, the idea is that we want that the augmentations of my inputs correspond to orthogonal transformations in my embeddings. So we know that uh, a function, like this, this theorem over here tells you that a function is OD invariant if and only if it's a function of the inner products. So if you have something that preserves the inner products, then it's going to be OD invariant. So uh, what we do is we take the setting that the classical setting, the, 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 the classical um, contrastive learning setting, and then we add a loss term, which is the loss term that uh, is zero if and only if your, trans your transformation in the embedding is equivalent. And this is, this is how the loss looks like. So for all augmentations uh, in A and for the so the expected value over augmentations in A and the expected value over uh, your, your training points, you want that the inner product between the, uh, e the embedding of the augmented points is equal to the inner product of the embedding of the points. So if you, like the, the, the fundamental theorem of invariant functions tells you that this is going to be zero or like I guess this term here is going to be zero if and only if uh, for every augmentation uh, there exists uh, a transformation in the orthogonal group such that f of a of x is equal to the rotation of times f of, uh, the rotation of f of x or like the orthogonal transformation of f of x. So this tells you that you can make you can make that uh, 
loss function to be zero, even only if the augmentations in the input space correspond to orthogonal transformations in the embedding space. But in practice, uh, you are not going to be able to make that loss function equal to zero, so you're going to be approximate equivalent with respect to that. By minimizing that, you're going to find that a transformation that uh, approximates that property. And in order to be able to have that thing equal to zero, you need to be able to see the group of augmentations, which is typically not a group, actually, because you use croppings and you use weird things, uh, as, uh, as a subgroup of the orthogonal group in order to be able to, to make this loss function equal to zero. And so you can see that, well, if, if, if your group of augmentations, if your augmentations form a group, which is not always the case, uh, then, and if it's a compactly group, then you can see it inside OD if D is arbitrarily large. But that's, that's not what is happening in practice. What is happening in practice is that uh, you are making it closer to be uh, equivariant by using this loss function. And we have some experiments that show that um, uh, for, for, different, uh, for, for different classification problems, image classification problems, we see that imposing this equivariance improves the, the accuracy of the, of the models. And also maybe this is a, an interesting feature of it. It's like, so here the augmentations take these input images and then they make them like a little bit more yellow. And then when you look at the closest image uh, of the yellow version of the model, they will have like the yellow feature is gonna be present. Whereas when you do it in the invariant way, it doesn't really see the change on the color. So it kind of makes sense to move away from the invariance because you also want to be able to capture the nuances of the, the changes in the in the images in the in the original space. Okay. Uh, so, with this, I'm going to finish my uh, talk and say that, okay, my the, the the point of this talk was to say that approximate symmetries can be a good inductive bias for machine learning models. In particular, I talked mostly about graph learning, but also in contrastive learning, and I mean I'm. I'm happy to chat or like discuss things about uh, invariant functions, equivalent machine learning, representation theory, and how do you use it in machine learning models, and I don't know, many things. And uh, these are my references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Soledad, for this great talk. It's a very nice starting uh, for this conference. Is there any question from the audience? Can you um, explain again the how sim, what was it? It was sim car, like how, the, how using the symmetries change is different from uh, usual augmentation? On the mm. last example, yeah. So um, maybe this example, this this plot would show it. So the the classical invariant contrastive learning, what it does is like the augmented versions of the same Im image get mapped to the same point. They're invariant with respect to that. And so here, what we want to do is we want to have that uh, the like if you have uh, a transformation that takes that does like some form of augmentation in the input. So here you have the, the coloring, like change the coloring scheme. You do the same thing for these two objects. So doing that transformation corresponds to doing a rotation in the embedding space, a small rotation in the embedding space. So that, that augmentation, you can, um, you can have like an interpretable way of understanding like if I move in this direction in the, in the embedding space, corresponds to changing the color by this, in this form. So, so. so concretely what happens is that maybe you need to mo uh, like warp the data less to do the embedding because normally you need to smush all the points together and that might have, that might force you to learn a very complicated function in order to map all the different colors to the same point. 
but now your embedding space is bigger. Yes. And you that may, and therefore the mapping can be simpler, and maybe this is yeah. why it works better. You still need an invariance term in the law because you want things that are uh, that that are the that come from the same object to be mapped close in the in the embedding space. But also you want to be able to interpret the augmentation in the input space as a transformation, as a linear transformation in the embedding space. Okay, so this is just added then. Added, yeah. Okay. It's another thing that you add to the okay, Thanks. Maybe Okay, there is another question. In the meantime, maybe the next speaker can prepare uh, him or herself, I do not remember, by just connecting. Uh, for every speaker, you just need to connect to the Zoom, and that's it. Then you present from your computer. Okay. Um, okay thank you for your talk. I came a little bit late. Uh, like, um, like you make mention of two application of this um, method can we um, is it applicable to like uh, um, in the, um, in breast cancer classification for example I'm working on breast cancer classification using multimodal machine learning um, how do we uh, use this kind of uh, strategy or methods in that area because I can see that you are doing uh, augmentation and in the breast cancer area we have to be very careful with medical information for example in histopathology uh, so, so the, the last part of like doing augmentations, uh, I don't know what are the class of augmentations that it would make sense for you to do it, uh, uh, but uh, there's some forms of equivariant machine learning, like, in, like in, in equivariant with respect to small rotations or small uh, transformations of the image that could be useful, but I would need to look exactly at what is your specific application because it doesn't, it's not that you can take something and use it out of it. Okay, maybe I'll have a chat with you after that. Someone left a phone here. Yeah, it's mine, and sorry, I forgot that there will be a coffee break before, <laughs> I'm ah. sorry. I'm not uh, wake up properly. Uh, I have a question, actually. Ah. Uh, all this is based on the knowledge, on the a priori knowledge of certain variances and equivariances. Is there a way to learn non-trivial symmetries uh, that you may not know a priori? Uh, uh, yes, there is There's some work that, that does that. There's a paper by uh, Andrew Wilson at NYU that, that learned some form of uh, symmetries from uh, the training of the model by, uh, by parameterizing the symmetries as like, uh, like, using the matrix exponentials. Uh, but the, I think that that's uh, an area that it hasn't been explored enough, and I think that there's a lot of things to do in that space. Okay. Like, it, you need to have a very specific assumptions of like, how do you want your group to look like, and then find mm -hmm. your, your, group, uh, your, your group transformation. So in that, ex in that case, it was like, like uh, groups acting linearly in a specific way. But uh, yeah, in general, I don't think that it, that's a solved problem. Well, thank you for the talk. Um, that result on the equivariance relationship where like if, if you have an equivariant, um, that, that representation theorem, mm -hmm. how general is that if you don't have like the orthogonal group acting? It's like, is it more general? Do you have uh, like yes. different group actions? So in order to be able to see the uh, e e equivariant functions as gradients of invariant functions, you need that the representation of the group is orthogonal. But there is a more general, more general way to see it that doesn't require that. And the idea is that uh, if you have an equivariant map from B to W, then uh, then you can see it as, as an invariant map from B times W star to R. And that's where this whole thing comes from. So, uh, so then in the orthogonal, uh, orthogonal group, the representation on the duals is the same as the representation in the original space. So that's why it's acting on the same way. But then in, in the case that you want to do, then you have to look, work with the dual representation the representation in the dual here. 
Does that make sense? I can, I can share some references with you, but okay. it is, there is a generalization that looks like a little bit different from what I show you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And so another question on the first part of the talk, uh, how do you choose, like, in that case you have like, instead of getting the whole group of permutations, you get like a subgroup tree, and how do you pick like the smaller subgroups which are not the whole SN? How do you pick the subgroup? Yeah, so, what kind of heuristic uh, you So use in, uh, we, we did it like, um, like based on the, the different applications that we had. So, uh, so what we typically did, but maybe there's better ways to do it, is by doing clustering on the nodes and then do like the full permutation in each cluster and then like semi direct product with the automorphisms of the, of the structure that you get after clustering. But uh, maybe you don't have to do clustering and there's other ways to relax the symmetries that make more sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, so if there are no further urgent questions, maybe let's keep them for the coffee mm -hmm. break, which is going to take place on the terrace, and we resume mm -hmm. in 25 minutes. Thank you very much, Soledad.